I'm Brian Kepper. I'm a 10 times South African motorcycling champion. My family and I have chosen to live in four ways. There's some really great suburbs in our neighborhood. There's a lot of families living in the surrounding areas in places like Lone Hill and Cedar Lakes. What draws people to Cedar Lakes is that it's so close to Broadacre Shopping Center, Cedar Square, and Four Ways Life Hospital. Lone Hill is a major draw card for many families. It's got some great smaller commercial centers and some fantastic schools like Crawford College. From an entertainment point of view, Monte Cassino really comes alive at night. There's so much on the go, and there's an incredible energy in the area. Our family just loves the fast-paced lifestyle that Four Ways brings. But honestly, the thing that attracted us most to this area was the active lifestyle that it offers. As a family, we've chosen to live in Four Ways because of the lifestyle and convenience, and this is our neighborhood. Good evening and welcome to episode 27 of the Pu uh, Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandu Kumal. We're on day 54 of the national lockdown. I know many of us in Gauteng are eagerly waiting for you know, an announcement that we might go down to level three. So we'll be waiting with bated breath to see whether or not we'll be able to go there. But of course, this evening, we'll be speaking about tips for buying property if you're married in community of property. And this also goes to you know, the different types of marriages that you might find yourself in. If you remember last week, Friday, one of our viewers at home actually asked a question about the nature of their marriage and how they can best navigate if they wanted to buy a property uh, with a partner whose credit score was not that great. And we did promise that will bring in an expert to help us better understand what the implications of the different types of marriages we find ourselves in are when we're buying property or on different assets. And tonight, to help us unpack this and better understand this, I'm joined by Vinashri Mana, who is a partner at Weber Wenzel. Good evening, Varashini. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, and um, thank you for having me. So I think, I mean, let's probably look at the, I'll say like the three major ways to get married. And perhaps the fourth one might even be the customary marriage. So of course that the first one is a lot of people like using that term, you're married in community of property or you're married out of community of property. And then some people will say you're married with or without accrual. What are the differences in those different ways of getting married? Okay, so basically you get married in community of property or out of community of property. If you get married out of community of property, you can either get married with the accrual or without the accrual. If you don't specifically exclude the accrual, the accrual is included in there. Um, and in community of property is basically what is yours is mine and what is mine is yours. So you've got in community, out of community, out of community with and without accrual. So that's and basically child. And, and, and then let's perhaps look at what the implications of those different ways of, I'll say, marriage are when it comes to things like property ownership, because I think a lot of people might not understand 
uh, some of the implications, perhaps you were young, or even if you're not young, I think so many of us might be, you know, getting married and not perhaps understand some of the legal implications of the way that we choose to get married. So when we look at these, uh, you know, different ways in community of property or out of community and accrual and uh, non-accrual, what are some of the implications when it comes to property ownership? Okay, so basically in community of property means that you are jointly and severally liable for each other's debts together with the profits of the marriage prior to the marriage during the course of the marriage as well. So if your spouse gets sequestrated, you get sequestrated with your spouse as well. So your ability to contract um, is hampered by your spouse's activities. So that's the difficulty. Also, if you are married in community or property, when your spouse goes and signs an offer to purchase a property, you need to go and co-sign with your spouse. So you two, both of you need to do it jointly. Uh, one can't, or bond the property, for example, you've got to do it together as well. Out of community or property is completely different. It, you, it allows you to keep your independence so you can go out and purchase a property on your own, on your own credit rating, your own credit score, uh, without your, your spouse's knowledge or consent because it's not required. You go, you purchase, you make an offer to purchase, you get your bond approval, you can do everything autonomously. We, um, the with and without accrual comes into effect is on dissolution of marriage. Now, what happens to this property that you bought, depending on whether you have the accrual system in place or not? If you did not have the accrual system in place, that means everything you gain during the course of the marriage remains yours and his remains his. So basically you get married, you walk away with what you have, he walks away with what he has, what he's acquired during the course of the marriage, and you just part ways clean. That's without accrual, you don't share in anything. Not each other's profits, losses, debts, nothing. You just basically go away. With accrual means that on dissolution of marriage, and dissolution of marriage, not just divorce, it's also on death. The, the person with the higher accrual, accrued value during the course of the, uh, the marriage, will have to share with the other spouse, um, depending on what their contract says, um, the assets they gain during the course of the marriage. So that's basically what it means. And I think before we even look at, you know, anti-natural contracts, what they are, um, and perhaps some the different ways that you can um, navigate them. Let's look at customary marriages. I mean, we were talking off air just a little bit that so many of us might find ourselves um, perhaps wanting to get married. And in addition to, you know, going and signing and having a civil union, we're very likely going to be following certain customary uh, ceremonies um, before we actually go and sign. And what so many of us probably don't realize, as you were saying to me off air, is that by the time you're having those customary celebrations, the law essentially um, regards you as married and you're essentially married in community of property. Can you just break that down for our viewers at home? Because I think so many of us probably do not know that or even understand that at which point are you regarded as um, you know, married in terms of customary law? Okay, yeah, no, that's absolutely, um, it's important and very vital. So when you are negotiating your Lebola um, or customary um, customs, um, you need to take into consideration at which time in that negotiations uh, is um, your, cust your uh, custom regards you as married. So if it is at the celebration time, is it at the negotiation time? Because different customs rec um, recognize it's the marriage at different uh, parts of the tradition. So basically before you conclude and um, um, the access, before the, it's uh, celebrated, your marriage is celebrated, you need to have already entered into an antinatural contract. Because if you don't do that, you are now considered married and the type of marriage is married in community of property. So the, the time to consider it is before you conclude and celebrate your traditional marriage, you need to go uh, and see a notary in public 
and decide on the, uh, your antenuptial contract, talk about what type of marriage you, uh, you, know, you want to enter into, et cetera, and sign your contract prior to concluding this marriage, uh, your customary marriage and having the marriage celebrated. It's very important. That is the point at which the law decides whether you are married or not. Not at the time you go and sign your civil certificate, you know, at home affairs or wherever you're going to celebrate that civil marriage. It's before, it's just before you celebrate your customary union. And I think then let's probably get into, you know, the issue of an antinatural contract. We've already made mention of it during this conversation. For viewers at home who might not be aware, what is this antinatural contract? Because I think so many of us who probably, you know, watch different law series on TV, we talk about prenup and we kind of, you know, throw that word around quite a lot. But of course, in South Africa, we operate slightly differently. So perhaps if we could help us understand what that contract is and some of the clauses perhaps that go into an antinatural contract. Yes. So basically, it arranges your matrimonial property system of spouses. One of the clauses that go into it is that you are in on the verge of celebrating a marriage. So you go to a notary public, you sign this document, which you call your antinuptial contract, which is the equivalent of a prenuptial contract that you would hear on, on a SOP, for example. Then you need to celebrate this marriage. If you don't celebrate your marriage and just say you break up in the interim, this antinuptial contract is not valid. Although it's registered in the deeds office, it just lies there and it just accumulates dust. It's, it's of no force and effect. The other thing that goes into an antinuptial contract is uh, why, it's, why it's important, it is to exclude the community of property and the uh, community of profit and loss as well as to either you include or exclude the accrual system. So that's very important. If you don't say you excluding uh, uh, the community of profit and loss, that means you're, it's going to be included. So you are still gonna pay in the, the, the loss part of your spouse's um, debts. So it's quite important to put in your antinuptial contract that you are excluding that. Um, and then when you talk about whether you include or exclude your accrual system, the, um, that's the differentiation or the main factor in how you decide you're going to progress with your marriage. At that point in time, you're going to decide whether you are going to go completely what's yours is yours and what's mine is mine, or we are going to share in um, the fruits of this marriage. And people don't realize that you can share in the fruits of this marriage in percentages. You can share in the fruits of this marriage 30-70, for example. You can share in certain aspects of the fruits of this marriage. For example, it is for um, your work, uh, income derived from work or income derived from a company, dividends. You know, there's, there's so much you can, um, do with this antinuptial contract. There's so many things, so many different ways of wording it to suit your particular lifestyle, what you want to include, what you want to exclude. Sometimes something is extremely um, sentimental to you. And therefore, when you start off your antinuptial contract, you don't want to start it off on a no value. You have this um, car, which is extremely important to you, you bought it with your first paycheck. And therefore, over the years, it, it grew in value or not, but you want it to be yours and you don't want to share it or at a later stage have to now sell it to match the accrual system. You can exclude it. You can exclude your gun collection. You can exclude property you previously bought. You can exclude just about anything you want to exclude from this marriage, or you can include things you want from this marriage. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a very flexible document that people don't understand um, normally that you can do so many things with this document to actually decide and um, navigate through your, your, your matrimonial property system prior to entry into that marriage. And, you know, because normally we are all very, you know, we're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and we are so excited about getting married that we don't want to actually 
um, think about what's going to happen in the future or there's a possibility that we're going to get divorced. But the antinuptial contract is not just about divorce, it's also about death. That's something I want to think about because you, you, you will decide on um, the accrual if you're going to get married with an accrual on both death and divorce. And then the spouse can bequeath the rest of uh, uh, the dead person's assets. So you need to split your accrual first. And then, because if you are married with the accrual, you can't now just decide that everything that I own, now I'm gonna suddenly gonna give to the SPCA because we, now, we had a horrible relationship and I can just give it all away. You can't, you will, the, the, you gotta get a, 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 um, an accountant in, they'll work out the, excuse me, the accrual and then whatever's left over can be given to the SBCA. Yeah. So, so it's I a think, I, I actually, document. I'd actually like us to stay a little bit with the, you know, with this uh, anti-natural contract. Uh, perhaps, you know, help our viewers at home. Uh, I mean, you've already given us such a great overview of, and this is something I also didn't realize that there are so many things you can decide to put in, so many things you can decide not to put in, that it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is split 50-50, because I think that's also the misconception that many of us probably think um, is, is the automatic assumption when you uh, enter into, or when you sign that anti neptal contract. So even understanding that it isn't necessarily the case. Perhaps what are some tips you can give to viewers at home uh, when, who are looking into you know, having an anti-nuptial contract drawn up? Some of the things that they should be thinking about. I mean, obviously both parties will hopefully have different attorneys who advise them and sit down with them and say, okay, so this is what you currently have in terms of your assets and your liabilities. This is where you're currently going. This is your career. But certainly for people perhaps who might not necessarily have that kind of support, but know that they'll be getting married, hopefully by the time we're able to actually celebrate our weddings and have an actual wedding. Um, but what are some of the legal considerations that they ought to be thinking about um, before signing an anti nuptial contract? Okay, so uh, Samo, what's really important is that recently uh, there was a, a bit of change in our law. Previously, we were able to sign special power of attorneys. So you basically authorize um, a secretary in, in a law office to go and execute this antinuptial contract in front of a notary public. Um, and then the notary public will execute this document and lodge it at the deeds office. Now you have to do it in person. And one of the, the, the main reasons behind that is that I, as a notary public, have to look at you and note whether you are under duress when you are signing this antinuptial contract. Because sometimes when you're getting there, you're driving there together and you've now, you are scared or you've been told not to ask for um, more than you're bringing into the marriage, et cetera. So some of the tips that I would give to people that are intending on getting married and with an antinuptial contract would be one, you have to look at your age. If you're a younger person and you have less, then, you know, uh, and you don't and have any kids, etc. It's good, you know, uh, uh, and you have no start, uh, starting value. So getting married with accrual won't really affect your assets um, as much because you have, you know, very little at the point in time. But for older couples where you either have proceeds from a previous divorce, you have kids, etc. Um, so you need to then protect their inheritances, you need to protect their schooling. It's, it's far more wiser then to get married without the accrual because then you can protect the assets that you currently have so that you can um, be able to, to take care of your kids from that, your previous marriages or you know, from your previous relationships. The other things that you need to take into consideration when you are uh, uh, drawing up an anti nuptial contract your pension. Your pension, you may have worked for the last 12 years and you have somebody who is a, a, a serial entrepreneur that doesn't succeed. That's something that you need to take into consideration that, you know what, this is your pension and you want to keep it separate um, or you want to exclude it from your, your anti-nuptial contract. Um, also, uh, go, go back and think about what you've decided. 
and the draft that the notary public sends to you to have a look at it, make your notes on it, ask questions. Uh, go, this is, it's, it's not final until you sign on the dotted line. So go back, think about what you said, ask as many questions as you would like. And there's no such thing as, 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 a, as a silly question because uh, you're paying a professional to give you a professional answer. So if you felt that you are under duress or stress or you did not want to agree to X, Y, and Z, go back to your office or go back home, call your notary public and say, what, is this possible? Yes, no, I'm not comfortable with X, Y, and Z. Perfect. I'm joined by Vinashri Mana, who's the partner at Weber Wenzel. And we're talking about tips for buying property when you're married in community of property. If you've got any questions or comments, do send them through. We're going to take a quick break. And just after this, we'll be taking some of your questions and comments. Welcome back to episode 27 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamandungwa Kumala. We're talking about tips for buying a property if you're married in community of property and also unpacking the different ways uh, that you could potentially get married and what the implication of those ways are on your property portfolio. And to help us better understand this, I'm joined by Vinashri Mana, who is the partner at Weber Wenzel. Thank you very much, Vinashri. Now, before we went you know, to the break, we actually got in more questions and comments from users at home. Of course, if you're at home and you want to find out more about you know this particular topic perhaps you're finding yourself uh, maybe you're about to get married or you're already married and you're already seeing that there might be you know different legal implications to the way that you chose to get married that you'd want a bit of clarity on do send in those questions and comments and um, the first one here comes from elizabeth Lidella who asked so would you advise couples to get married out of community of property without accrual to avoid complications in the future um, Zama, like I said earlier, it actually just depends on your personal circumstances and how you uh, want to govern your relationship. So, um, so that won't be my advice. It just depends on where you find yourself at that particular point in time. Uh, because it, what happens if you decide that you, become, you want to become a stay-at-home mom, you have kids, you don't accrue any assets, but I mean, you're a home executive, you're spending your time raising children or on the side, you're helping your husband do the books of his business, et cetera. But are you getting a salary for it? At the end of the day, you're gonna walk away with what? Zero, because you decided, you all mutually decided that you're gonna be a stay-at-home mom or he's gonna be a stay-at-home dad. So it really, it depends on your marriage and um, your relationship. Uh, to determine whether you get married with or without a tool, because it can have a negative effect as well. Uh, we've got another question in here from Gatiago Achape who asks, is it possible to amend the ANC once it's signed and registered? No, it's not. No, it's not. You can't amend an antinatural contract. No. And, and then is there a way to perhaps draft a, a different one? Um, so if you can't amend that one, are you able to nullify that first one, perhaps draft a, a separate one altogether? Because I'm sure a lot of no. people <laughs> might find themselves five years into a marriage and thought, perhaps I made the wrong calculations. I now want to change. You know, are they actually able to do that? Or you're pretty much stuck with what you, uh, what you decided on at the beginning of that uh, marriage? So um, the question is, is, what you're stuck with, 
we decided to get married. So, um, well, it's two ways. Yes, if you decide to get married with an antinuptial contract and what you decided at the outset, can you can continue um, with that. You can amend it, but then it becomes an amendment inter partes, just between you and your spouse, not an amendment for creditors. So between you and him, you can decide you want to amend the X, Y, and Z, that's fine. But when it comes to creditors and people on the outside, it does not affect them at all. What you registered at the, the deeds office is what is there. But if what you decided at the outset is to get married in community of property, and then um, as you got older, because and then you got a little bit more learned or uh, somebody advised you otherwise, you started a business and you decided, you know what, now it's time for us to change our matrimonial property system because every time I contract, I need your signature, every time you contract, we need my signature, et cetera. And we can't buy property separately, et cetera. Um, yes, you can then go and you can do a complete new application at the high court. It's called a post-nuptial application. So you get a contract registered, uh, approved by the high court. Um, the application is moved by an advocate for you, and then you take that post-nuptial contract and register it at the, uh, the deeds office, and then it will govern your relationship as if you got married um, out of community of property. And then from there going forward, it will be an out of community of property marriage. So you can change from in community to out of community. Yes. And that was actually a question that came in there from Stephanie Whitboy, who had asked, once someone gets married um, and without an ANC, can this be implemented later? And I suppose then it's that post-nuptial uh, application that you made reference to. We've got another one, um, Gatako, following up on her earlier question, who says, thank you. How expensive is it? She, she says that she heard um, that, you know, sometimes these contracts can be quite pricey. So how, how expensive is it to get into an acting anti-nuptial contract and perhaps even you know the the, the post uh, nuptial application okay so the anti-nuptial contract itself not very expensive actually not at all expensive it's relatively relatively cheap it just depends on the complexity of it so if you're going to use um go back three or four times and you've got lots of uh, amendments and you change your mind Lots of time, then then obviously that's going to that's going to become a little bit more expensive because now it's an hourly tariff. Somebody's charging you per hour to do this, but if you pretty much uh, understand what you need, etc., it's 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 quite inexpensive actually. Uh, post nuptial contracts, unfortunately, is a little bit more expensive because if your attorney does not have right of appearance in the high court, you would need to get the services of an advocate. So you're paying an attorney, you're gonna be paying an advocate, you're gonna to have to be paying for advertisements in the government gazettes, notice to your creditors, et cetera. So that becomes uh, far more expensive than an anti-nuptial contract done pre your marriage. Um, but normally people that enter into post-nuptial contracts um, have uh, more to gain to do that rather than not having it done yeah and, and sorry sorry there's one other thing that uh, couples that already have anti-nuptial contracts you need to uh, ensure that your anti-nuptial contract was executed before your marriage uh, certificate was registered so what we find as well Zama, when we're doing um, people are buying property they come to us and they say, well, we married out of community of property. Here's my anti-nuptial contract. And we say, okay, fine. Can I also get your marriage certificate? Because I need to make sure that your notary public have executed this document before you entered into your marriage. And what we find, and I, at least four to five times a year, that the notary public actually never uh, um, executed it before you got married. So remember, even on the day you are getting married, you can still go and execute your anti-nuptial contract, but you can't get married on the Saturday and then go uh, execute an anti-nuptial contract the following Monday. Mm -hmm. Then it's, it, it is in community of property. And I think, you know, when you talk about some of the, the, the costs, especially with that post-nuptial contract, I've heard, you know, stories of couples who sometimes think, you know, it's so much admin, it's, it, it makes better sense for them to, 
legally get divorced, so dissolve the marriage, and then they'll remarry and this time sort of marry the right way around, which probably sounds slightly dramatic, I think, for, for most of us who kind of live relatively ordinary lives. But I, I mean, I've, I've heard those instances where they say it's actually easier to, to do it like that. And they've sat down with their lawyers and even the lawyers have said, you know what, it actually does work out if you do it like that, as opposed to try to retrospectively, you know, fix some of the things that you probably didn't do right the first time around. Um, Zama, apart from the drama <laughs> and the stress of divorce, uh, we need to also understand that uh, Section 27 of the Insolvency Act applies in this uh, instance on, or registering of any anti-nuptial contract. So if your intention was to try and avoid creditors, et cetera, uh, um, the, um, the court can set aside your uh, generosity in your antinuptial contract as avoidable disposition in the first two years of your marriage. So if in the first two years you uh, register this antinuptial contract and in this contract you decided to give your wife property or donate to your children property uh, or, or, or give to your um, yeah, your wife the property and then you've got curses knocking at your door and you now don't have this property anymore they can look into the donation that you made to your wife and then at that point in time if it's within the two years of registering the antinuptial contract they can set aside that so you you run the risk of that so if you decide uh, okay I split, uh, I, we get divorced, we take 50-50, I get this house and you get that house and now we uh, get uh, registered an anti-nuptial contract, we exclude it from our anti-nuptial contracts, the um, uh, creditors can still attach it in the first two years. So it's not really a foolproof way. Yeah. Now, Varashni, you know, any, do you have any tips then for, you know, people who are currently married in community of property um, and perhaps want to look at different ways that they can uh, protect their assets? Yes. So it depends on what their assets are used for. So, for example, are you buying this property to hold as a long-term investment or are you buying this property as a trading commodity? Um, and you married in community of property. Well, even if you're married out of community, but more so in community of property, you can buy the, the, the property in a trust, uh, or you can buy the property in a company, or you can buy, um, uh, uh, if there's already registered CC, you can obviously buy it in the CC. But what you need to be very um, mindful of is that what is your purpose of using these vehicles in which to uh, um, to buy the property? Or what's the purpose of the, um, the property? Because, and the reason why I say that is because when you trade with the property, you will eventually have to pay a capital gains tax. And certain vehicles um, yield a higher capital gains payment than others. So like a, like a trust, for example, um, if you are holding it for long term, it's, it's okay, but on a short term, you pay higher capital gains on the trust than you would um, if you had bought it in a company or a CC. So you need to be mindful of the tax implications of, your, of the vehicle you're choosing to use. So there is that vehicle, you've got the, the trust or company or a CC as a vehicle in which to, to buy property in and to obviously keep it separate from your, your estate. However, the purpose of why you're buying the property needs to take, be taken into consideration because now you don't want to be saddled with a higher capital gains tax. And I think lastly, you know, any tips for unmarried people who are, you know, looking into at some point getting married, um, some of the things that they should be considering, some of the legal things that should, they should probably, you know, be thinking about when they explore the different ways that they could potentially get into a marriage. Uh, well, um, as we discussed earlier, um, they must definitely think about an antinuptial contract and they should consider uh, using separate legal counsel in terms of the antinuptial contract. If not, um, see the same legal counsel, so decide on some unbiased person that you, you can, you know, uh, the legal practice counsel has a list of notary publics that they can, you know, access in their area. 
um, choose somebody that's unbiased, and you can go and see the, the, the legal counsel separately when you are getting married so that you understand the implications of your marriage. Um, also, when, when you're getting married, um, think long term. Think, think uh, 25 years from now. Don't, not your current situation and how you feel. And don't be governed by your feelings. You need to be rational about it. I know all of us don't want to think about it because we have butterflies in our tummy and we're so excited. Um, you know, funny enough, my own anti-nuptial contract when I had to sign mine and now thinking about the, the, the money part of it and the, the, the property part of it upset me. Although I'm, I'm legally trained, it's still upset me like, I don't want to think about this when I'm getting married. But you have, because you're not, not only is it, are you thinking about yourself, you're thinking about your future children, uh, what the implications for you and your kids in, in 20 years time, and what is going to happen. And you need to, to think about this with a sober mind. And, and not with the emotions that you're feeling at the time, which is, and, and do it in advance. Do it a, a month in advance. Do it two months in advance before you get married. Don't leave it for the last minute because when you do, you are caught up in the emotions of what's happening and then you will agree and you tend to normally agree uh, involuntary um, to any request because you just want to get this over and done with. Do it well in advance. Uh, you know, you can do it about three months in advance uh, from your date of marriage. So, you know, think about it, do it to the sober mind, and but think about it and discuss it. It's very, very important that you discuss it. You don't want to have to suffer the consequences of your decisions at a later stage. Um, and you know, I've actually got, and, and we're speaking about this off air, around just how difficult it's also probably possible, um, it, it, it is to, initiate this kind of conversation with your with your partner i mean here you are you've been dating let's say a couple of months or a couple of years and now marriage is you know the the next step in your relationship so i think one of the things would probably be what are some of the perhaps questions we ought to be asking each other first um before we even get lawyers involved i mean of course lawyers are going to get involved for us to be able to sit down but before that uh because by the time i go to my lawyer i'd want to say okay so i've spoken to my partner here's his side of the story, here's my side of the story. What are some of the questions that we should probably be thinking about as partners who are potentially about to be getting married um, in the next few months? Okay, so when you go to the lawyers, you're gonna have to have certain things decided upon prior. So there's a few things that you're gonna have to decide on. What do you, what do you wanna keep as your own like I said to you something that's either sentimental or for whatever reason you want to keep your own so come up with a list of things that you want to exclude into remember if you do, if you're getting married uh, anti-nuptial with accrual if you don't exclude it specifically exclude it it becomes part of your accrual so for example if you had a house that you purchased and you didn't exclude your house now and you then later on sell this house and make a profit it becomes part of your accrual because you never excluded it. However, if you excluded that house, you then take that, while you're married, you take that money and then you go and invest it into another property. That money and that property will always be excluded. So those are the things you need to take into consideration. Come up with a list of things that you want to exclude. Come up with all your assets. Think about everything you have from shares, to, um, to RAs, to provident funds, to jewelry, to um, uh, art. coins, art, et cetera. And, and decide on uh, a list of things that you think you want to share with your partner and those things that you want to exclude. Because remember, your, your notary public is going to ask you, um, what is your commencement value? Because you can, they would also need to have a commencement value. You can either say... Um, uh, you want to exclude a, um, a Mazda 323 uh, white 1984, etc. Or you can say, I want to exclude um, the value of the Christ 30,000 rands. So you can decide whether you want to exclude the thing itself or you want to exclude the value of the thing itself. Yeah. Uh, you want to add the, the the value of the thing as your commencement value. So then when you're working out your accruals, they'll take out 
um, that which you had added in as your commencement value. So think about things that appreciate in value. You may want to exclude the thing itself. Uh, things that depreciate, maybe not so much. Um, come up with the amount you want to start off with your assets, but remember also you can't say, um, I want to exclude 300 million rand when you can't back it up with proof as well. So you can't say, you know, so you must be able to validate what you are excluding and you must own it. You can't be excluding your mother's AMC pots, for example. Yeah. <laughs> I think we mustn't come for our mother's AMC pots. I've heard way too many horror stories of people fighting over those. We've got a question here coming in from Vicha Anthony, who asks, can the partner claim from your, from your investment property that is under a company when you're married in community of property? Say that again. So can your partner claim from your investment property that is under a company, so you've bought it under a PTY, when you are married yes. in a community of property with your partner? When did you buy it in community of property? Oh, sorry, so when did you get buy it? Before you get married or? Um... Let's assume this was bought you know, after they got married. So it's in a PTY, but it's after they actually got married in community of property. And the company is and... also registered after they got married. Okay, and you are obviously the 100% shareholder. Yes, there's also made that assumption. Right, then you can claim 40% of your shares in the company. Okay, so if you're the 100% shareholder, they'll, they can claim it. If you have 50%, then they'll claim a percentage of that as well. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. But Perfect. remember that the, the, the difference is uh, when you're in a PTY, your, your, the company is separate from you. So for creditors, it has a different implication than it does for shareholders in a marriage. Yeah. Nashree, thank you so much for that. I think this is where we're going to leave it. This is one of those topics that uh, we'll probably come back to uh, because I think many of us will find ourselves you know, having some or other legal question when it comes to the way that we're married or looking at getting married. And of course, our assets, because so many of us don't think about it. I and mean, you were saying earlier on that even as we approach this conversation with our partners, we should do it well enough in time so that we don't let our emotions get the better of us. And also just don't let the admin of it, you know, sort of um, make us lazy to put in the work um, and make sure that we end up having a contract that both parties are going to be happy with. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And that was Vinashri Mana, who is a partner at Weber Wenzel. And of course, we were looking at some tips for buying property, depending on the type of marriage that you're in and with the particular focus of being married in community of property. That has been episode 27 of the Private Property Podcast. We're back tomorrow. And tomorrow, of course, being Wednesday, we'll be speaking to AFSA. You absolutely do not want to miss this one. And I hope uh, you're going to be staying at home uh, and abiding by the lockdown rules. Many of us are waiting with bated breath to see when we're going to go down to level three. So folks, do stay at home, stay safe until tomorrow evening. Hi, I'm Nicolene Terblanche and I'm part of the SA Women's Hockey Team. And I'm the Technical Director of Tax Hockey. And I'm also the Assistant Coach for the first team mates. five years ago. Very Green is a really safe place and the people are really kind. Very close by, like this. In the morning I will wake up, make myself a cup of coffee go for a jog in the Ferry Glen Nature Reserve or even just in the neighborhood. It's safe, quiet and the environment is really nice. I love Ferry Glen because I'm near the city but I'm not in the city. Club, to clear my mind um, on my own, to relax 
and just to enjoy a round of golf. In Pretoria East, we really have nice uh, places to visit like Minland Mall and Brooklyn Mall that is really close by. There are also a lot of top schools in the area like Pretoria Boys High and Yoshko Mendo Park. One of the most beautiful places to see the whole of Pretoria is the Fort Capricorn viewpoint. And that's my neighborhood.